Okay, hello and welcome to the Patent Math Conference and this session, Fireside Chat, um, <clears throat> from our keynote this morning. My name is Charles Moeller and I am joined by my colleague, Jeff Matheson. Before we start, I just want to remind you that if you are using the Sketch app, the announcements for this conference are under the info tab. All announcements for today are also on the conference website, uh, as well as presenter bios and handouts. Uh, mo some sessions don't have handouts, so if you don't see any, that's okay. And if you want to enable closed captioning, click on the CC icon on the toolbar. Today, we have the opportunity to have Dr. Kirshner with us so that we can ask him some questions on his um, keynote speech this morning. And the way that we're going to work that is that if you have a question <clears throat> that you would like to ask, we're going to ask that you go to the bottom uh, where the Zoom bar is and you click on reactions and you click the raise your hand uh, button. And in the corner of your screen, you'll see a little hand that gets raised and uh, we will unmute you so that you can ask a question. And at that time you can lower your hand and it'll go away. Or if you would like, you can ask it through the chat um, and we will identify who asked the question um, and pose that question for you to Dr. Kirshner. Um, if you are going to unmute, if you would like to unmute and ask the question yourself, please feel free to identify who you are, where you're from uh, before posing your question to give us a little bit of context um, and to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, and with that being said, we'd like to open the floor to any questions for Dr. Kirshner. Yeah, thank you very, very much uh, for the introduction, uh, Charles. Um, the idea behind this was that um, I will answer any question dealing with educational psychology, cognitive psychology, my uh, keynote this morning, any other things that you might have heard from a podcast or read a, uh, a blog or whatever, anything you would like to ask. The idea was not that I was going to give another lecture here, but um, that uh, anyone can ask anything and I will try to answer it. And we'll go as long as it's necessary um, to answer any and all questions. If that takes 15 minutes, it takes 15 minutes. If it takes an hour and a half, it takes an hour and a half. Um, my, I, I, I'm a, an emeritus professor and of educational psychology. I've written quite a lot. I've dealt with things like um, uh, learning, um, uh, complex cognitive skills, uh, cognitive load theory, use of media in education and training, um, desirable difficulties, um, yeah, you, adjunct questions, you, it, it's far ranging. So anything that you might want to, to ask, you can ask. Please don't be shy. If you don't ask anything, you make my work very, very easy because I'm not going to go over to a, a presentation, but um, please feel free. And then there was silence. Susan, Susan Steinmetz, great. Somebody who's not afraid to kick it off. <laughs> I'm not afraid. So thank you. Um, my name is Susan Steinmetz. I'm from West Philadelphia Achievement Charter in West okay. Philadelphia. Um, I enjoyed your presentation. Um, so some of the things I was left with several questions. Um, I'm a special ed coordinator and special education teacher. So one of the things that you talked about were um, like the desirable difficulties, right? Yes. And you talked about how learning has to be hard, right? Um, not hard, no. but there's like a balance between the load. Yeah, you right? have to. The idea is to get your students to be cognitively active with what they're learning. And if they're cognitively active, um, then that means it they have to make a larger effort, but the mm -hmm. effort that they make is beneficial to learning. If, if you give me one minute to explain what I mean by that, then mm -hmm. we can continue. Um, we often see teachers having their students work together on projects. For example, uh, a project on uh, volcanoes or a project on, uh, to, uh, on, on, on Martin Luther King or whomever. And what you often see is then the students will come together and they'll make uh, paper mache uh, 
uh, mountains and put a uh, Coca-Cola bottle in it or an empty plastic bottle in it and make the paper mache around the outsides and color it beautifully. And then uh, for their presentation, they'll put in some uh, Coca-Cola into it and put a Mentos mint in it and it'll start bubbling over and everybody, whoa, fine. And you know, you say, okay, they were they were engaged and they were busy and, and they were working together and there was a lot of interaction between them. But if you then ask the question, okay, that's really, really nice, uh, Mary, but what does that have to do with plate tectonics? Huh? And magma? Huh? And, um, uh, uh, you know, like, um, what do they call? Shoots and, 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 and chimneys? They look at you as if they're seeing water that has caught fire. They were active. They were busy but they weren't cognitively active. They weren't cognitively busy. They spent two or three weeks making something, but actually not learning from it. That's the difference between being active and cognitively active. Back to you, Susan. So I guess my, my, my question leads me to when you're in the classroom with my students, right? And they are working hard and they are thinking right, where they are. So if I just look at a, a math lesson for my students who may be in fourth grade, but are really at like a first grade level, many of them often have very, you know, the working memory is very, it's a weak area for yeah. them. Yeah. And it's really, I guess for me, I guess my question is like, how do I find the balance between um, working at where they are, right, mentally, and getting them to be closer to a standard when it just seems like we don't have this time to give them, like when you talked about the interleaving and the practice that you need, yeah. and then the, you know that the interweaving of all these different areas of content. And I just feel like we're always falling short. Yeah, I understand. And that's um, not very enjoyable. And when I talk about being effective, efficient and enjoyable also for teachers, it's not very enjoyable when you have that feeling. It's very, very hard. Um, there's, you, you, have, um, you have something called differentiation. I think you have it also in the United States and you have convergent and divergent. Uh, divergent is we have different children with different needs and they all get different goals. Right. That's something that actually increases the gap between the haves and the have nots called the Matthew effect, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. What you do is you set the, the, the bar lower, you choose to make it easier for them by setting the bar lower, but if they achieve what you set out for them, they still learn less. The idea should be convergent and then make use of different approaches to help them. Now, of course, if they have really strong educational needs, you talked about first graders, fourth graders who are working at first grade. The first question is, do they have different learning needs or do they just have bad education at the beginning? Or did they come in with a, 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 um, a gap which the teaching that they got when they were in first grade didn't help close? So the idea is to first make sure that at the first grade level, you choose the right step size and the right approaches to help them. And to do that so that you can discern the difference between, uh, how, how should I say it? Um, um, Benjamin Bloom, not from his uh, hierarchy, but Benjamin Bloom from his book, Handbook of Cognitive, uh, Handbook of Formative and Summative Evaluation uh, said, uh, what people learn, it, they can you can probably bring most, if not all, and please excuse the 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 probably I'm, I'm I'm no longer an English thinker, but the regular or the normal student, yeah, should all be able to achieve the goals that you set. The only question is, it's a matter of time, it's a matter of approach, it's a matter of how large the steps are. Uh, what we often find is that the steps are too large 
mm-hmm. for these types of children in which they don't learn, they are affirmed in their idea that they can't do it. It's not a very enjoyable experience for them. They then learn, I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I have a problem, I can't do it. So the idea is to make the steps that they take as large as you can, but to ensure success by the student. Because in difference to what people think, motivation doesn't lead to learning, but learning leads to motivation. If you see that you can do it, you're motivated to do more. If you think you can't do it, if you don't have success, you become demotivated, think it's not for me, I'm not the right person, Um, I don't have the abilities, I don't have the knowledge. So you have to create situations in which students, your learners can experience success and make use of all of the, you'd call it pedagogical techniques, I'd call it didactic techniques or instructional techniques that you have to help ensure that within the small steps that you're taking, that the students have success. Okay. But that was one of your questions. Yes, um, let me go back to my notes. Um, so I guess when you were talking about the the um, the interweaving of the concepts, right? Yeah. And, um, and I, it, it triggered in my mind, I was thinking about how so many of the math series now are on this spiral, right? And they go from this topic and then they bring back this topic and it, you know, this rotation of the A, B and the C. Yeah. But what I have found and where I feel my students struggle the most is that they never have enough of the practice, which then makes that interweaving possible, right? True. So yeah. there's like this constant push to interweave all of these topics, which I get it, except that we are not giving our kids enough practice. So my question then was, when they did the study on this interweaving, right, what is the age group of which they did this? Like, I look at my kids and I say, okay, we can get to interweaving, but I need more time for practice. Exactly. Exactly. Susan, you're you're, you're completely right about this. Um, That's the difference between understanding a concept and using it in a type of checklist. What you described to me is, well, we know we should interleave, so we'll uh, we will do it. Whereas if you really understand interleaving, it says before you can go on to the next one, you have to in any event be in, uh, assured that the learner is capable of carrying it out. So it means a certain amount of non-interleaved practice until that child reaches a certain stage or state of proficiency. And once they've achieved that, going on to the next one. And people who do it wrong think, well, I present it once and let them practice once, and then they go on to something else. And that's poor use of of, of interleaving. Um, In Dutch, we have a saying, um, you've heard the bell ring, but you don't know where the ringer is. Yeah, so you're, you're completely correct. And that means you have to, in your curriculum, and in, I don't know if it's a standard curriculum or it's your own, I don't know to what extent you can determine what you do in what order and for how long. But in any event, it must be the case that within the curriculum, if you make use of something like interleaving, that you ensure that the basic skill is there before you go on to the next one. If I want to bring it in terms of playing tennis or squash, you will first want them to be able to serve before you vary the different six types of different serves that someone can do, a side hand, a back hand, an an overhand or whatever. First, they have to get that one down, but then they have to make use of different ones. And then once they have the serving down, you know, they've used the service and the return and the volley, then you interleave them with each other, but you have to be uh, assured that the basic 
skill is there before you start to mix and match. Right. You understood it perfectly. Okay. <laughs> I, sometimes I just feel like we have to get everybody else to understand that, right? I agree with you completely. I completely. You know, I, if you if you have if you're handing this in for showing um, that you've had um, continuous um, uh, um, what is it CPD um, continuous okay. professional development. You get mm -hmm. a, a an A plus for me from me. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> I'll put that on your diploma. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, Stephanie, Stephanie Hand, put up her hand. <laughs> yes, thank you, Dr. Kirshner. That I appreciate that. Thank you for what you shared this morning. I I really appreciate a lot of your insights. I have a lot of screenshots to contemplate later. Uh, oh, by the by the way, let me tell you, um, I gave. Um, Jared, a PDF of my presentation, and he will be distributing distributing blah, 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 distributing it now or in the very near future. But I never give my handouts away beforehand because I like people to take notes and think about it while I'm doing it instead of just sitting back and um, and, and and absorbing. Right. I yeah, and I will be revisiting that. Although they won't have the thumbnail of your uh, screenshot attached to them, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but I do have a question about the uh, generative activities. Uh, yes. I'm particularly interested in uh, your insight about which of those um, that were presented by the the research. I think it's uh, Farella and Mayer. I think was what yeah. you had referred to. So yeah, I'm I'm, yeah. thinking it's, I'm a third grade teacher in a school in um, Hellertown, Pennsylvania, yeah. and so a classroom teacher with some graduate work in special education. So I'm particularly interested in students with uh, emotional and behavioral challenges. And yeah. with that lens, what which of those um, approaches to uh, the generative activities, like which would you recommend or which would you, what are your thoughts on those for that population of students in terms of uh, bringing those into a classroom? Well, with young students, things like summarizing are really difficult because you have to be able to um, d d distinguish between uh, the higher level and the lower level um, things. Also making uh, maps, Concept maps uh, and things like that are also uh, fairly difficult because it also requires you to separate the wheat from the chaff, you know, might be a good way of saying it, in order to do it. But even the youngest children can do it if they're, number one, given help, for example, um, are given what the concept map looks like and a few of the major terms, and then they have to find the uh, relational terms, for example. Um, you have to remember that, that you can do that. It's not a question of all or nothing. I can give, I can tell them, make a concept map or, 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 or summarize it. You can help them in doing that by giving them scaffolds in order to do it. That's number one. So you can do it with almost all age groups, which to realize a certain amount of, of, of domain specific knowledge is necessary if you want to make use of those. The second is each of those techniques requires, it's, it's their, their, their skills. And those skills required you to number one, explicitly teach them. And number two, explicitly practice them with them. And if you don't do that, if you expect them to be able to do it, um, you'll be very disappointed in the fact that they probably can't. So. There's no group that I can say one works better than the other. Um, it, 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 it could be the case that making a drawing for the group that you're talking about is better. If I explain to them, for example, um, uh, the difference between uh, a half and a quarter and a third and they're making use of circles, to have them draw that might be a lot easier than if they're trying to make a concept map of as the numerator increases the denominator this and those types of things. So it, you have to understand the generative activity and then tailor it 
to, to the, the content and the psychological processes, the cognitive processes that the student has to be able to carry out in order to do it and then teach them how to do it before they, you expect them to do it. I can give you a really good example. We, we uh, had high school juniors. We gave them a, a piece of text that they should read. And we were making use of retrieval practice. And retrieval practice meant that one group just read it. Another group read it or, or read it actually twice. One group read it once and answered questions. And one group read it once and had to write a summary of it. And we figured that writing a summary of it, because it's a generative activity and it makes them think deeper, they'll learn it better. And it ended up that they couldn't, they didn't learn better. You say, you know, like, this is crazy. They, it, it, all, all of the signs point to it should work. And for some strange reason, it doesn't. And I said to my PhD, who was working with me on it, I said to her, Kim, why don't you just take a look at the summaries that they've made? And maybe we can see something in it. And it turned out that these high school juniors wrote the most horrible summaries because they had once or twice had it in their English classes or in Netherlands in their Dutch classes. How do you make a summary? But never practiced it. Never had the biology teacher or the history teacher or the economics teacher ask them to summarize things and then looked at the summaries and help them to learn how to do it. So they never practiced their skills. And of course, they didn't learn from them. They learned much better if we wrote the questions and had them answer them, whereas that should never have been the case. And we just assumed that these 16, 17 year old high school juniors were capable of writing summaries. Now, that is the problem. You have to look at how do I teach them? If I want them to make use of a generative strategy, how do I teach them to make use of that strategy? Did I put you to sleep, Stephanie? No, yes. Okay, I think... sorry. I was I was I was under a mute uh, option. Oh, okay. They, they just muted me. I I really appreciate your answer and thank you. Um, okay. You have I, any more questions? Uh, I'm sure I will, but I will take it back in the queue. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dr. Kurt. Quite all right. I see no hands up. Has anyone written anything into the chat? We don't have any questions in the chat at the moment. No, I'm not going to get up and do a song and dance. Um, Dr. So Kirshner, I, I had a question. Um, okay. I know you said in the keynote, you were talking about that video that you wanted to share. Would you be willing to share it now? I was kind of interested in seeing what it was about and, and what the, uh, the researcher was going to talk about. Okay, I will do that now. Uh, hold on. I'll do it in this way. Share screen. Oh. Um, I'm not allowed to share screen. You haven't made me a co-host. Should be. Let me double check. Nate, no. Somebody there has to make me a co-host. Oh, uh, you know what? It, it was because of no. You. It says you're a co-host. Now I, I can do it. Okay. I okay. just became co-host. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> it's okay. Um, here it goes. Oh, shoot. Sorry. I chose the wrong button. Okay. This is it. I can't hear it, Dr. Kirshner. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. 
Oh, Lord. This is, I have to go to this. This. Okay. We'll start again. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. After 50 years of heavily funded research, there is no stable consensus regarding best teaching practice. There's no common body of knowledge. There are no common standards of practice. At one poll, we have romantic ideas of children joyfully teaching themselves. These ideas have been expressed in whole language, language experience, open education, discovery learning, child-centered education, hands-on experiences, and constructivism. At the other poll, we have the results of empirical research results that have shown the advantage of instructional support and systematic in, in, instruction. In her last book, The Academic Achievement Challenge, Jean Shaw said that in reading, this romantic view, and romantic is her term, is imbued with love and hope. This view holds that a child learns to read as naturally as he learns to speak, if only we encourage him to use his language and his cognition when he reads interesting books. But sadly, she wrote, this view has been proven by research, theory, and practice to be less effective than a code emphasis, particularly for children who are at risk for learning to read. This conflict between a romantic approach to instruction and an empirical approach to instruction is not a question to be decided, Jean said, by more research. It's not the research, she said. The results of the research on beginning reading have been the same since the 1920s. The problem is getting people to accept the results of the research. But I believe, sadly, that the vast majority of academics in curriculum and in teacher education will not accept research results that conflict with their romantic, sentimental, child-centered ideology. Now, that was Barak Rosenshine. That's the father of the thoughts about explicit instruction. Uh, he was giving a keynote, and um, I wanted to put it in my keynote at the end, because it's not about the fact that we don't have proof that it works. It's that people often aren't willing to accept the proof because it conflicts with their ideology. And teaching and learning isn't a place for ideologies. Uh, philosophy is a place maybe even the political arena, but education is also is not a place for ideology, just like physics isn't. I mean, you don't hear people who have the ideology that gravity doesn't exist. But you tend to have people in education who have the ideology that um, the best way to have children learn to read or do math is to let them play instead of to instruct them how to do it. That doesn't mean it can't be fun. That doesn't mean play can't be implemented, but as a tool, as an instructional tool, it's, the, it's not the method, it's the medium that you used. Yeah, You use play as a medium to enhance or strengthen the method that you've chose, chosen. It's not the method. And that's the difference. People think that I will say, okay, don't let children play. That's the last thing I say. They say, they think I say like, motivation isn't important. I've never said that. Motivation is incredibly important. But motivation doesn't lead to learning. And play is not the proper method for instructing. And you'll see that everywhere from the soccer field 
to the uh, to, to, to to the mat at school. Um, children, of course, are running around playing with the ball, but if you want them to learn to play soccer, you also have to teach them how to kick the ball, how to get it to curve, how to um, uh, pass a defender, and those types of things. Those are all types of techniques. And then you allow play as a way maybe to practice it, as a way of enhancing your instruction. But don't think that a top soccer player has reached the top by just getting on the pitch and running around and playing. They've had a hell of a lot, or a heck of a lot, sorry, of um, explicit instruction as to how they could and should play. And that's for every sport, that's for every musical instrument, and that's for every subject that we want students to learn. Any questions? Nothing currently in the chat. Then the only thing I can say is people can send me their um, questions if they want to, either through you or to me. You can also make that offer to those who were at the uh, keynote this morning, earlier. And I will do my best to try to answer them or they can send them to you and uh, or Jared. And if he can then make a, uh, a summary of them, assuming that he knows how to make a summary and assuming that you, Jeffrey, also know how to make a summary. And I will then try to do that um, uh, in a document and send it back for distribution. Okay. All right, so we'll, we'll ask one more time. And remember, your question doesn't have to be specifically about the keynote. It could be about your own practice. It could be about anything <clears throat> when it comes to cognitive processing. It looks like Mrs. Knob may have a question. Would you like to unmute or would you like to put it in the chat? Um, no, I could unmute. Thank you Great. very much. Um, why, don't you ever, why, why, why is everybody afraid to let me see what they look like? Oh, oh I could put a video on. <laughs> Yeah, please. Okay, thank you. Very good. Very good. So um, I'm a middle school learning support math teacher. And our middle school has been doing an initiative for, I think, two years with a company called LSI. And um, they have learning targets and success criteria, which is all connected to the standards. Um, but one of their biggest pushes is that we do group learning or partner learning and that the teacher only talks 20% of the time when the kids are in the class, the rest of the time they should be in. And I'm really struggling with this because I keep looking um, them to put it, functioning it, skills that are students across the board. And I'm not just talking about learning support. I'm talking, I push into regular ed classes and I see these kids with lack of executive functioning skills, that, um, not to mention that this is a big age in the middle school that they're um, actually starting to learn some more of those skills. It's a time where it really, it seems from what I've been researching that it's a big um, area of development that those skills get really developed at this time. And um, I'm very frustrated because I sat in your your um, thing this morning and I'm like, oh my gosh. And then you end with explicit, explicit instruction. And I'm like, that's exactly what we should be doing. And we're not. And it, yeah. it's, and I'm wondering, like, how do I help people understand that? And I think the first person with the question said the same thing. It's how do I get other people to understand? Yeah, what? that's that's the hardest. That's the hardest thing. Number one, tell them that there is absolutely no, but absolutely zero, empirical proof that that idea of twenty percent is what they should be doing. It's important. Um, 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 Tom Sherrington talks about think, pair, share. I yes. do, you do, we do. Mm -hmm. There are no percentages attached to that. You, I do as long as it's necessary to get the children to understand it. We do, you do, until we're all sure that 
you've grasped it. And then we do with each other working together in groups. There is zero, zero, zero empirical proof that this idea of 20% is what you should be doing. In England, it was also the case, the, um, uh, the inspectorate went around and gave teachers a bad report if they spent more than seven minutes talking during the lesson and said you were talking too much. Sometimes you have to talk for 30 minutes about something. Sometimes five minutes is more than enough. It's you know like how long should your legs be long enough to reach the ground? Is what we say in 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 in, in Dutch. So um, that's 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 sheer utter nonsense. And I tell them, well, take your um, your uh, rule and put it somewhere where the sun never shines. I'm going to teach my children properly because my goal is not spending five minutes or seven minutes or 12 minutes. My goal is that my students learn it in a way that they can make use of it, that it transfers to other areas. And that requires a complete arsenal of techniques of which one of them is me explaining things. And send them, have them ask me for a uh, keynote for them, and I'll explain to them also that it's um, BS. Let's put it that way. And I, I wonder sometimes, you know, like trainers come in and we have a specific trainer um, that does all our trainings. If sometimes if they don't twit, put their own spin on to things. So I don't know a lot about it because special ed has been pulled into a hundred different directions. So we're yeah. also doing letters training, which is explicit instruction. So, um, so we've been missing a lot. Not, I wasn't, I was, con I was glad actually. So, um, and I see like we've gotten away from teach, like what I think is teaching, like what you're describing is like, what just seems like kids are given stuff and then said, go do this activity. And they do the activity and then nobody ever actually goes over what they did and what they got wrong. A good example of that is I had several of my students are using a lowercase i for any words that involve I contractions in the work. Yeah. It was like three of them, which is really weird. They don't have anything to do with one another other than they're in the same grade at the same school. They're not necessarily friends or, and um, for, for the most part, I just talked to them about it and explained how, it, and they made them aware of it and they stopped using the lowercase I. And I'm like, okay, how many other things have we just let go exactly. that would have just taken a few minutes of a conversation to say, hey, you messed this up. This is how we really do it. And then just double check, make sure it's happening. And then I remember when I went to college, uh, 35 years plus ago, and um, a friend of mine and I both were at the same college and we both graduated from the same high school and we both were spelling the word a lot as one word and as not one two word, words. Yeah. And no one, and I thought back way back then, how did I get through high school? And nobody said, hey, you're yeah. spelled a lot wrong. You yeah. know, and I think that was probably a very not as frequent as a of an occasion of happening as it is now. But I'm thinking now it's like, wow, it's happening all the time. But that's that's a complete degradation of the of the uh, profession of the teacher. If you remember, if you saw my one of my last slides, it was that um, number one in the hierarchy is domain knowledge, and you're an expert in the domain that you're teaching. And the human species is one of the few species in which we borrow and organize, where we make use of knowledge of others to increase our own knowledge. And this is a complete um, negation of the idea that a teacher is a professional and has a body of knowledge and has the pedagogical techniques in order to teach it. Let's have them be a guide on the side and have the kids choose what they want to do, when they want to do it, and you just stand there and you help them when you think they need to do it because otherwise you're um, damaging their um, poor little souls by pumping it full of, 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 of useless knowledge 
uh, this this romantic idea from Rousseau of the child as an unwritten page and uh, is only corrupted by um, by education, going up to Ken Robinson saying um, the exact same thing. Uh, school instead of increased learning um it's 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 complete utter drivel but it's even worse than that because it's just um denying the fact that a teacher has the knowledge and the skills needed to carry out her or his task properly and i think that that's horrible that's you know and um yeah shouldn't be the case. Thank you very Thank you. much for your input. It's Appreciate quite all right. It's quite all right. Thank you for your question. I believe we have a question from Donna as well. Yes. Good morning. I am from Indiana. I teach second grade. I missed your um, keynote this morning. I had an appointment to go to. My question is kind of silly, I think. Um, I've got kids who can't do their math facts, okay? They can't memorize them. I think they have it and they don't. My, my theory is maybe they've got weak number sense. I heard you kind of discuss how you have to, um, I guess, master one skill to go to the next skill. Is it kind of like reading a little bit where you have your PA first, then phonics, you move up the little you know, hierarchy no, of it's, skills, it's, I guess? It's, 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 it's get the basics down. Okay. That's the most important thing. Um, math education, you have realistic math, and I, I, I think uh, it, it's called, and traditional math. Uh, Barry Garlick has written books about it. I wrote... Um, uh, a good book with um, um, a good article with uh, Sarah Hart, and he just uh, died, a, a colleague of mine, Rick Nelson. I can uh, send it to Jeff or Charles. Um, I don't know if I can put it into the chat if you're allowed to add. Um, uh, yes, you can add a document. Shall I put it? If you bear me. Yes. Please, yes, thank Add you. To the chart. Um, uh, Rick Nelson, it's about math. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Designing math standards in agreement with science. Okay, I know where I can find it, designing. Um, documents. Publications, designing. Here it is. Here it is. Um, I've added it. This thank you gives you an idea of if you look at what educational psychology and cognitive psychology teaches us about how you learn. This is for 100% applied to mathematics. And this should be able to help you. And it was also written not only by a crazy educational psychologist, but also math teachers in the lower and secondary grades. So it should also be fairly understandable, okay? Hey, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Okay. Quite right. My uh, my pleasure. Hey, Stephanie Hand raised her hand again. <laughs> uh, hi, I'll turn my camera on this time too. Yeah, please do. Um, okay. <laughs> hi, and thank you, Donna. I didn't know that was a question I had as well. I am uh, absolutely perplexed by students coming to me in third grade without their math facts. So that's for later reading. Um, my question, if you could comment on, um, you spoke a lot about the long-term memory and um, strategies and approaches for building that with students. Um, one area that I am really focusing on in a third grade classroom is working memory. And it mm -hmm. also, I'm interested in terms of like practice and theory, how does it work? How can we build on it in a classroom with mathematics? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Are there approaches or things I could be doing as a teacher in a classroom that can help students utilize that, maximize it? Yes, there are. And it's also written in that article, so you can read it in there. Um, uh, automatizing. Um, if, if I 
ask you six times three minus four, yeah? And you have to, those are all slots in your memory, in your working memory. Um, if I can reduce six times three to immediately recalling that it's 18, I've reduced the load on the working memory because then it's only 18 minus four. And if I've also automated that 18 minus four is 14, because I've learned the, time, the, the addition and subtraction tables up to 20 or whatever, what I've done is I've increased the amount of air room that you have in your working memory to solve the problem, because that's part of a problem, because I've allowed you to make use of what you have in your long-term memory to recall it so that you don't have to process that in your working memory. Mm -hmm. And so every time what we often see is people now, they're allowed to make use of, of calculators, but doing those calculations while you're also carrying out the task increases the load on working memory. The more that you can retrieve a chunk from your long-term memory and make use of it in your working memory, the better you can control the amount of slots you have available in your working memory and uh, make sure that it's not overloaded. So if you, the best thing to, there are two things you can do to help your working memory and make sure that the children aren't overloaded, to use that term. One is to make sure that that which they need to answer the questions is as much as possible in long-term memory. You'll notice when I speak about short-term memory, I talk about five plus minus two new information elements. Mm -hmm. If it's already in the long-term memory, it can be retrieved as a chunk. It's not a new information element. The other thing is you can make use of pedagogical techniques that aren't very um, taxing for your working memory. By mathematics, one of the greatest ways is what's called a worked example. A worked example is this is the step and this is the outcome. This is the step, this is the outcome. This is the step until you go through all of the four or five steps. And that's the first thing you do. So you give the child the steps and then they have to give you the outcome in that order. At a certain point in time, you remove the last step. It's called a partially worked example. And you go from five steps to four steps to three steps to two steps to actually solving the problem. Now that's a pedagogical technique that is very low on extra mental effort. So what you've done there is number one, you've made sure that the things that they had to do in it were automated. And the other things, the procedure that they internalize it by leaving out, it's called backward chaining, the last one, the previous, the previous, the previous, the previous. Now, if you make use of pedagogical techniques that are not cognitively taxing and use of knowledge that has been stored in the long-term memory, you're then optimizing the area in their working memory to carry out new tasks and learn new things. Oh, but if you're trying to teach them something new, but they still have to count on their fingers how much is six plus seven, yeah? Or think about it, even think about it. If they're thinking about it, they're using their, law, their, their working memory. If they're retrieving it, if they say 13 immediately, they're not using their working memory. They're retrieving it from their long-term memory. And that way you free up in from, uh, room in their working memory for them to learn new things and solve newer and more complex problems. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think too, that that's why my concern is with the basic facts is I'm yeah. trying to build on the working memory, but really that that is only a certain amount that they have. It's really coming in with those facts, which is absolutely sucking up all that that time. Yeah, exactly. Um, prior to um, engaging in an activity, is there something they can be doing or that I can do? I appreciate the, the, um, the worked example, but is there something prior to instruction that is really helpful? Modeling. Modeling how you do it. Okay. So you say, okay, when we're doing addition, when I'm doing addition uh, uh, of uh, 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 um, hundreds, yeah, the first thing I do is I put the units 
by the units, the tens by the tens, the hundreds by the hundreds. I do this because when you're adding, adding a 10 is 10 units. So, you know, you, you explain it, how you're doing it, and you go through it. So you model with explaining not only what you do, but why you do it. So then if you go over to um, uh, worked examples, then the next thing they're, they're doing is you're giving them the steps. They have to think about the why. And then the next thing is you're removing a step. So there are all these different types of things that you can do. Prior is just modeling behavior. When I was talking about teaching my granddaughter, I modeled the behavior. First, we look left, then we look right, then we look left. Because what does that involve? Where you look, why you look, what's left, what's right, how you do it. Those are all different things that she also has to absorb all at once. So I model it and I explain why. And in that way, I'm freeing up room in her working memory to process what I'm teaching her, which is how to cross the road properly. I appreciate that. As you were giving that example, I did think of Elsa trying to cross the road. So exactly. I love the story. Yeah. It illustrates so much. Yeah. Uh, okay, again, thank you, Dr. Krishna. I really appreciate it. It's quite all right. Quite all right. Thank you for your question. Any other questions for Dr. Kirshner in the chat? <clears throat> Anybody like to unmute? All right, a question just came in, Chuck. It says, many middle schoolers, including regular red students at my school, do not have their math facts memorized. Any ideas how to get them to master their math facts? Practice, practice, practice. Practice, 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 explicitly and 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 and, and automatize it. Yeah, that's it's the, the idea that you first have to learn the concept and then you'll understand and you'll magically be able to carry it out. You first have to have the facts and learn them and make use of them. And it's just that's when behaviorism is really, really great. It's just that simple. Practice. Practice, practice. Um, uh, I was a student who, um, in elementary school, who had a big mouth. And I don't know how often I had to practice the ta times tables and things like that as a um, punishment. But that was the greatest punishment I ever had because it made it so easy to automate it and to know it. And now I can do the most incredible mathematics computations in my head because it's all, it's all in there and automated. And all I have to do is recall it when I need it. And Paul, there is a question uh, with regards to flashcards and specifically uh, asking if there's any research um, or, you know, in favor of digital flashcards versus the, the old school uh, cards on, on cardstock or cardboard. Yeah. Uh, there could be. I don't know of, uh, uh, of it. And I don't know why um, there should be a difference. Um, if you think, look at, look, at, look at it logically. The only thing I can say is that there's been quite a lot of research with respect to reading from paper and reading from screens that shows that reading from paper is better if you want to learn and understand things. And especially if there are time constraints on it. And the time constraints are um, actually more debilitating for uh, students with difficulties than students without difficulties. So one, there shouldn't be a difference. And if there's a difference, it's related to um, uh, um, what we know about how easy or difficult it is to learn from screen as opposed to um, uh, paper. But I don't know of any research on it, but I will go check it out, Mrs. Knaub. I will check it out afterwards if I can find anything on that.
if there's nothing more, then I'm going to go enjoy the shadow because it's really warm here in the Netherlands at this moment. I'm going to go sit outside with my wife, enjoy the shadow of our driveway or our backyard and uh, have a nice glass of wine. It's almost five o'clock, so <laughs> I can do that. All right. Thank Any you. last minute questions for Dr. Kirshner before we sum this up? I got a lot of thank yous in the chat. <clears throat> My pleasure. And uh, spread that um, article around that I sent uh, in it because it's dealing with cognition and learning maths. So that's exactly what this area is about. Um, uh, uh, Charles, would you do me a favor and also um, send it to Jared and ask for him to post it for all of the uh, conference participants, whether or not they went to the uh, keynote this morning, that it's part of the, uh, let's say, package of supplementary materials. Absolutely. We'll get that up onto the conference website. So okay. let me let me close this up then. If there's no other questions, I want to say thank you to Dr. Kirshner again uh, for having this conversation with us after his keynote this morning, um, as well as all of you who attended this session.